Good evening, everyone. Once again, a warm welcome to the international lecture series on clinical nutrition. This has been organized by the Clinical Nutrition Excellence Academy at Hexagon Nutrition Limited, Indian Dietetic Association, Mumbai chapter, and with academic partnership with Kenya Medical Training College. Um, hypercatabolic states require a high calorie, high protein diet. We've seen that in the last couple of sessions. Much like that, oncology or cancer patients also require a high calorie, high protein diet. It's not that simple though. Many a times, cancer patients, apart from being undernourished or malnourished, also have a condition known as cancer cachexia or cachexia as we call it. This is a result of the metabolic changes that are brought about in the body by the underlying disease condition. The effect of the medical treatment that the patients go through, either the chemotherapy or radiation therapy, and also uh, the turn of events that brings in, you know, uh, the oxidative stress and the inflammation resulting from the entire process, entire disease condition. Now, despite being recognized and understood that nutritional intervention is of key importance, it may not widely be accessible to all patients. So all our patients are not going to come with a similar nutritional status. And given the evidence that the nutritional risk and wasting that we see in patients with cancer, particularly cachexia management becomes remains a very big challenge. And therefore, in clinical practice, it's important to have a multidisciplinary approach with targeted nutrition in order to improve the quality of life for patients with cancer. So today, we have an expert here from one of the biggest hospitals of, of, of cancer in Mumbai, India, Ms. Purvi Mahajan, who will be taking today's session and she'll be deliberating on what are the specific needs for endonutrition in cancer. But before we begin, let me quickly reiterate the rules. Certificate of attendance will be given to all those who attend all test, 10 sessions followed by an objective test. Attendance for the complete session is mandatory for all sessions. Objective test will be a 100 marks test via Google form, which will be sent out to you on 1st of March, 2023. Uh, this will happen on 10th, 8th of March, sorry, not on the 1st of March. Minimum 80% is required to pass the test. We'll also be sharing the link for revision lectures somewhere about, uh, you know, 1st of March. Feedback for all sessions is mandatory. Feedback link will be posted at the end of the session in the chat box. Questions can be posted in the Q&A box and will be taken during the panel discussion. I request all comments and suggestions to be posted in the chat box and not in the Q&A box. Those attending from the YouTube link will not be eligible for the certificate. I now welcome our expert, Ms. Purbi Mahajan. She's a senior dietitian at Tata Memorial Hospital, and she'll be talking on enteral nutrition in cancer. Ms. Purbi Mahajan, like I said, is a senior dietitian in one of the biggest hospitals in Mumbai for oncology. She has a master's in dietetics and nutrition and also a PC in dietetics and hospital management. She has various awards for presenting research work at IDECON 2016, 2018. And she is also a faculty for various courses like COP PODC, Onco Nutrition Fellowship Program that is held at TMH every year. She's also an author to a, to a manual for pediatric parents, which has her contribution has been in terms of therapeutic Indian regional food recipes for pediatric oncology patient. And she has various other accreditation to her credit. I welcome you, Ms. Purvi, to start your presentation for today. Thank you, Sukhita. Um, on the outskirt, I'll just be sharing my screen. I hope it is visible. Yeah, it's visible. It's visible? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Just slide show. Yeah. Done it. Yeah, good to go. Yeah, thank you. Okay, on the outskirts, I would like to um, 
thank the organizers that is the IDA uh, Hexagon Nutrition and the Academia Partners uh, for inviting me for the lecture and with no further ado I will uh, start uh, on the lecture which is on enteral nutrition in uh, cancer okay so um, to start with just a brief introduction on what is cancer as we know cancer it arises from the uncontrolled cell growth okay and it is uh, in three phases that is it the progress goes on on initiation pro promotion and progression right so the in initiation is the cells are exposed to the oxidative stress or uh, to the endogenous or the exogenous uh, carcinogens and either they fail to repair by themselves or they fail and die okay and thus becoming uh, precancerous cells okay in the second stage is which is the promotional stage these initiated cancer cells is further stimulated through the cell signaling which allows for the cell replication and growth leading to excess dna damage that is beyond the capacity of the cell to repair okay and so this cluster of abnormal cells which is the tumor may grow into large lesions and or they can translocate into the other areas of the body resulting in the metastasis of the cancer cells to other parts of the body okay so this brings us to the definition of what is cancer cachexia so it is a complex syndrome characterized by chronic progressive involuntary weight loss which is poorly or only uh, partially responsive to the standard nutritional support and it is often associated with anorexia early satiety and asthenia that is muscle weakness which we say okay so basically the cancer cachexia usually attributes to uh, two main uh, two main components okay that is uh, there is there can be a decrease in uh, the nutrient intake because this can be due to the critical involvement of the gi tract by the tumor and it can be due to the cytokines and similar to the anorexia uh, anorexia induced uh, mediators which are there okay and uh, secondly it may be due to the metabolic alterations uh, to the activation of the systemic pro inflammatory processes so the metabolic derangement it may result in your insulin resistance there will be an increased lipolysis there can be a normal or increased lipid oxidation with the loss of body fat there will be increased protein turnover with a loss of the muscle mass and an increase in the production of the acute phase uh, proteins okay that's your crp levels or uh, the albumin which is there okay at the same time the systemic inflammatory reactions okay that develop with many cancers it is very important as they cause the loss of appetite that is anorexia and loss of weight thus this syndrome of the decreased appetite weight loss the metabolic alterations and the inflammatory state is therefore referred as the cancer cachexia as uh, 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 Sukhita just reiterated as well as cancer anorexia cachexia, uh, cachexia syndrome okay so what practically I need to uh, I want you all to um, understand is this site uh, this uh, cytokine induced metabolic alteration which appears to prevent the cachexic patients from regaining the body weight practically uh, the body mass which is there during the nutritional support and it is associated with a reduced life expectancy and are not revealed by only the exogenous nutrient alone so this brings us how will we identify cancer cachexia okay so uh, the pre cachexic phase okay it is uh, uh, classified as in case if there is a weight loss less than 5% if there is anorexia and there are metabolic changes okay then it is said to be pre cachectic if the weight loss is more than 5% or the bmi is less than uh, 20 and the weight loss is more than 2% or there is sarcopenia with a weight loss of more than 2% okay 
this is again often accompanied by a reduced food intake by the patient or there may be a systemic inflammation so this stage is called as the cachectic phase okay and then further on that is the refractive cachexia which sets in there is it's, there is a variable degree of cachexia the cancer disease both uh, they are pro catabolic and they do not respond to the anti cancerous treatment the performance rate of the patient is very low and um, even the life expectancy in these cases it is less than 3 months so it is up to practically it is up to 20% of the cancer death which occurs due to cachexia so this brings us to the importance of um, uh, uh, saying that is the cancer related malnutrition it may involve evolve into cancer cachexia due to complex interaction between the pro inflammatory cytokines and the host metabolism and the cancer treatment and its uh, the cancer as well as its treatment the result in severe biochemical and the physio uh, physiological alterations which are also associated which may lead to deterioration of the quality life of these patients hence depending upon the type of the cancer treatment that is whether it is curative or it is palliative the clinical condition of these patients and nutritional status the adequate patient tailor made nutritional interventions that we dietitians do should be prescribed okay that is through diet counseling through your oral supplementations uh, that's after you evaluate and then is on enteral and parenteral nutrition so this brings us to the importance of enteral nutrition in cancer so back again reiterating that is malnutrition as we practice it is very commonly observed in cancer patients and the adverse effect it adversely affects the quality of life and the survivalship of these patients so it is caused by various factors that is which includes your decrease in the food intake there is adverse effects from the anti cancer treatments the toxicities that they see and there is wasteful metabolic processes which eventually happen within the body system and with this if you go to see practically over the past two decades okay there has been a major advance in the methods and the techniques in the diet therapy of the cancer patients okay and the other diseases also and hence nutritional uh, the enteral nutrition per se is developing very rapid okay because of these endoscopic techniques that has made it simpler to place the ng tubes the rt the enteral tubes and uh, even uh, there are variety of these enteral uh, nutritional uh, uh, supplements which are available which are commercially available uh, for these patients and hence the enteral nutrition it becomes a very effective way to deliver the nutrients when the patients um, are unavailable to ingest the food because of the neurological problem or any structural abnormalities in your upper gi tract that is it can be your oropharynx your esophagus and stomach okay so to define as in the first lecture benjamin mam had said enteral feeding refers to the intake of food via the gastrointestinal system and the enteral feeding may mean nutritional intake uh, taken through the mouth or through a tube that goes directly to the stomach or the small intestine and medically we also refer enteral feeding as tube feeding okay so the enteral nutrition in non surgical cancer patients so the enteral nutrition by means of the your oral nutritional supplements and the tube feeding offers the possibility of increasing and ensuring nutrient intake in cases where the normal food and intake is inadequate so the therapeutic goal for these cancer patients is improving the functioning outcome that is by uh, preventing and treating the undernutrition which is there by enhancing the anti tumor treatment effects by reducing the adverse effects of the anti uh, tumor therapies and of course improving the quality of life okay so the nutrition therapy it should practically it has to be initiated exactly when under nutrition is already existing so that's the reason we have to see the patient we have to screen the patient at risk so when it can be it can be anticipated that is if the patient may not be able to eat or uh, 
uh, have appropriate food more than seven days and then enteric nutrition should also be initiated when inadequate food intake is anticipated for more than 10 days that is uh, there is a there is less than 60 percent of the estimated energy expenditure by the patient so it should be uh, also calculated in such a way practically that it's it should the um, en that is it should substitute the difference between your actual intake and the calculated requirement that is how much you calculate for that case okay and uh, how much the patient is taking so the difference the which comes that is it, that has to be substituted by your en okay and also uh, the recent guidelines they say that initiating en in patient is indicated upon decrease oral intake so when nutrition intake is uh, chronically reduced then the corresponding weight loss um, and worsening of the prognosis are anticipated okay so to determine um, a reduction in the normal um, food okay a simple way or that we usually do that is you can take a 24 hour recall okay that is much adequate to understand how much the patient is eating but at times if the patient is unable to eat you can also during your counseling or your uh, nutrition uh, uh, clinic visits you can ask the patient that is how much has been the intake has it reduced by 50 percent of the normal intake or has it been reduced by 25 percent of the normal intake the during before the onset of this disease okay and in patients who are losing weight okay due to insufficient nutrition intake the nutrition uh, the en should be provided to improve or to maintain the nutritional status and this may also contribute in maintaining the quality of life okay in uh, internal nutrition for the surgical patients there are evidences very clear correlationship between the degree of malnutrition and increased uh, risk of perioperative complications in the cancer patients which undergo surgery so it is known for from various studies that uh, you know the value of uh, the variety of nutritional status parameters which are there for predicting risk of uh, surgery uh, surgery complications are very important then is the surgical patients okay practice uh, gaining practical information such as weight loss or subjective or doing the assessment through the validated screening and assessment uh, tools which are there okay would provide a better base uh, basics of deciding whether or not you should delay the surgery okay so at least 10 days of the nutritional support is recommended in severely malnourished patients before major uh, digestive surgeries which are there and in non uh, severely malnourished patients a preoperative oral immunonutrition uh, can be associated with a 50 percent decrease in post-operative complications and the benefits of the immune enhancing diets uh, in severe malnourished patients are also remain to be proven okay there are a lot of studies so along with the surgery the patients who are undergoing radiation and chemotherapy along with that so the dietary counseling is first proposed that is first you need to do the dietary counseling and in case if uh, the the patient is severely malnourished uh, then uh, through the di dietary counseling you can then start uh, uh, the enteral nutrition uh, which can be then recommended okay so now after understanding the importance coming i, I will uh, sensitize you with there are certain specific um, uh, cancer types okay where the requirement of enteral feeding is required okay and certain cases so to start up with head and neck cancer okay now the special issues uh, which are uh, which we deal in head and neck cancer which all of us uh, uh, onco nutritionists will deal will be there'll be diminished oral intake there'll be painful chewing there'll be dysphagia that is difficulty in swallowing odonophagia that is pain during swallowing there'll be a pre-existing nutritional deficiency which is associated with alcohol consumption and tobacco use the there'll be a decrease in the appetite and there will be cachexia okay so there is a there is a condition which is called as trismus okay because it's not just i want to sensitize you all because it's just not just you know the patient is unable to eat so you know the you all should identify that the patient needs an ng to be put 
okay there is a condition which is called as trismus okay this is known as locking of the jaws and it is very painful uh, condition where the jaws are not able to open now this can be a post operative complication after an oral surgery or if in non surgical patient you know it can be also during uh, the radiation treatment where there, where there is a, a radiation induced trismus which is caused okay so the, what i want you all dietitians the young students to remember is the, the signs and symptoms because as a patient comes to you in the opd you should be able to identify so there can be a headache ear ache or there can be a joint pain even without moving of the jaws there can be cramping of the cheek muscles or difficulty uh, or discomfort in performing activities like brushing chewing opening of the mouth biting swallowing okay so usually generally the medications are uh, there is there are medications there is usage of a jaw stretching device where either your occupational therapist will give you and of course there is a change of diet that we as dietitians which we need to do now i just want you to see this the diagram which is there on the right hand side corner so to assess is the three finger um, the three finger space that they do the your or doctors so that can be uh, that can be evaluated by you as dietitians also so it is when it is a three finger space mouth opening as you can see here so uh, it means that the mouth is opening normally okay but in case if the mouth open is just two finger space or one finger space then the patient will not be even able to swallow in a puree diet to go to so even liquid diets to gulp in will be a problem because it becomes freezed it is locked okay so this is the time if it is less than one finger space there is there is where you have to specify get back to the doctor and ask to put an ng tube there is an enteral ngt tube to this patient so there are certain conditions like this okay in case you may try giving your liquid diet also but what i need to emphasize is just by planning the diet it's not going to help you because you require certain devices because as there will be no lip movement will the patient will not be able to grasp okay not, rather not even take in that fluid which goes so there is certain specific devices which you can try which is called as a squeeze in bottles or the straws for the fluids we can just squeeze in and just pushes back so the entire uh, ons uh, formula or your um, kitchen feeds can go and uh, otherwise there are special syringe okay which are made which has a curved end as you can see so even these can be used in case uh, you can see the uh, the availability into your setups if it if it is there so you can advise this during the diet plan and the counseling that you are giving to the patients and if it is uh, not available and still the patient is not able to have then we are supposed to go for an ng feed to go in so you have to ask a doctor to insert the specific specific Uh, spoons also if you can see the lid is very um, broad okay it's very tall so it goes directly uh, back to the back mouth uh, which is there okay then the second um, condition i would like to highlight is mucositis okay so mucositis as we know it is inflammation of the mucosal surface it is typically it involves the redness and ulcerative sources in the soft tissues or or, or the uh, mucus and uh, the oral mucositis it will manifest by erythema inflammation ulceration and ultimately he uh, ultimately hemorrhage bleeding in the mouth and the throat so to assess this to evaluate this we have the who oral toxicity scale which is there so in case if there is soreness in the patient when he is uh, coming to you uh, for the dietary advice and when you are uh, when you are uh, asking the symptoms in case either there is soreness or there is erythema that is the redness in in the mucosa then it is counted as grade 1 here the patient can tolerate the normal food okay uh, then is in case if there is erythema as well as certain ulceration seen if you can see into the picture then the patient can swallow solid food but cannot uh, uh, tolerate spicy food okay then if the ulcerations will extend the redness will also extend and the patient is not able to swallow food so here the pureed diet is taken or they say we can have only liquids then it is called as grade 3 and grade 4 is where the mucositis has extended okay the patient is not able to even swallow his own sputum okay spit so that is the time even the liquid diet will not go so as and when what i want to reiterate is as and when the patient is coming to you for follow ups 
or when you're checking on this patient, keep on evaluating the patient on this in case if he says there is a slight ulcer or redness in his mouth. Because we don't want our patients to go to the level grade 3, okay? Because this can happen when the patient is put on chemo drugs, okay? Uh, chemo drugs which can um, uh, aggravate these conditions. There are certain conditions like cisplatin at times, the patient gets admitted and within 24 hours, the patient reaches to grade 3. So once you understand the protocol, uh, once you understand the protocol of this, you know, you again, you can ask, for a, a prophylactic that is you can ask the, the doctors to initially put the rt feed that is the rt tube to these patients before starting the treatment so the nutritional status of this patient can be maintained okay so the nutritional challenges becomes is in is in these patients will be maintaining the nutritional goals so the weight maintenance during and after the treatment becomes a challenge weight maintenance post treatment until the patient is able uh, to consume the solid food again has to be taken care and it is a challenge for the dietitian completing the treatment also becomes a challenge and the weight maintenance during the transitional uh, feeding from enteral uh, uh, nutritional support is also very much important and here the importance of prophylactic placement of the enteral tube comes in so you as the dietitian should be ahead and ask your doctor in case if he's not done that before the treatment that is because you will be protecting or safeguarding the malnutrition later on which will happen okay so then it's better to put in place an ng and let the patient have the oral feeds which are there so in case if this aggravates mucositis as the cycles of radiation when the mid treatment cycle comes in you are there your patient is able to have the entire uh, uh, diet plan that you've done through the enteral feed which is there okay so the weight stays maintained then the next condition is dysphagia okay, dysphagia means difficulty in swallowing and uh, this can be expressed by the patients in various ways that is having pain while swallowing being unable to swallow having sensation of food getting stuck into your throat or he may say it is got stuck into your chest or it is behind behind the sternum bone which is there they can be drooling okay then there can be harshness in the voice or there can be regurgitation that is bringing up food back okay it comes back into your mouth then there can be frequent heartburns then is having food or stomach acid back into your throat unexpected weight loss they can be gagging okay that is gagging is just the opposite of swallowing uh, they can be coughing as the patient drink something he'll start coughing okay and it, he brings everything out and having uh, to cut food into smaller pieces for avoiding certain food because again there will be trouble in swallowing so for these patients also there is a scale okay to evaluate and then you can understand because just because a definition when the patient comes to you and says that i'm not able to swallow and i can take soft diet okay the texture of the soft diet is also very important and, and it is very vague because you know uh, there are around eight stages in actual clinical evaluations where you go for this soft diet to come in so the treatment for this will be the muscle exercises or uh, which will be given by the swallowing therapist they can be change in the head and neck position back again the chin tuck position that is to hold as you swallow uh, given by the swallowing therapist so in case in your hospitals if you have a swallowing therapist it will be as advisable that whenever the patient comes to you for a nutritional consult you may first advise the patient to go to the swallowing therapist or take and consult if it is practically possible for the patient even to get an outside consult because there is a there is a staging of the consistency that the swallowing therapist will give you on that basis you as a dietitian will be in a better position to plan the texture and consistency of the diet of the patient so the nutritional status and maintain and the patient can adequately gulp in the food okay then it's so soft to thickened drinks will be modified and then there can be a surgery done and of course depending upon the evaluation either the patient might require enteral feeding before the surgery or after the surgery okay so there are certain um, uh, certain uh, frameworks which they have come together this is the hc protocol which is the inter just to sensitize you all so you all know where exactly how to evaluate okay this is the international dysphagia diet uh, standardized initiative 
which was brought about by the Australian uh, dietitians and the swallowing therapist, where uh, they categorize the uh, uh, where they categorize the texture of the foods, okay, um, uh, and the liquids or oh, into uh, subcategories which were there, okay, and these are that is from zero to four. They have uh, categorized them from thin, slightly thin, uh, slightly uh, thick. A mildly thick, moderately thick, and extremely thick. Whereas the solids are again staged from uh, grade three to seven. Okay, so uh, and on the right hand side that I have showed you all, these are our Indian based standardizations which we do. Okay, are based upon the consistency. But I must say that every state, every country, every state, they all have. Uh, everybody has their traditional. way of eating okay so this is according to the australian standards there are again the canadian standards where they have come with their own protocol so i think so it is high time that every country should you know emphasize and bring their own protocols to help these dysphagic patients you know to uh, have a better lifestyle and eat uh, and uh, you know maintain their nutritional status and uh, this again how will you as a dietitian will decide depends upon the psc uh, scale of head and neck cancer that is uh, which is called as the performance status scale okay basically it is divided this evaluation factor is divided into three subsets that is the normancy of the diet the public eating and the understandability of the speech now this is actually done by a swallowing therapist but you i just want you all to understand so that's how you better understand the report what the swallowing therapist will send you so basic uh, so by public eating because these patients are you know they also want to live in dignity so it's not that during the treatment after that in case if there is a prolonged dysphagia which is there the patients also need to socialize so there they become very much conscious so there is a rating scale which they have given for the public eating and then is understandability of the speeches for the speech and swallowing therapist for us the dietitian this is important the normancy of the diet so the pay, uh, he will just ask the swallowing therapist will ask the patient to gulp in water around 30 cc and see how does it go in okay in case if he starts coughing immediately then the, there are there is a higher risk of the patient to aspirate okay and that's how the score will go from 0 to 10 so that means that the patient can tolerate a uh, uh the, the uh, tolerate only the uh, okay that is he will not be able to even tolerate the clear liquids which are there and that is the phase where enteral uh, 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 tube feed insertion is required okay so just to uh, make your make your know that is a 10 uh, is a score where clear liquids can be tolerated 20 will be warm liquids 30 will be all your pureed diet which you remove it from the blender 40 will be the soft food uh, which is which does not require chewing it's just gulping your mashed potatoes your puddings okay then 50 is a score which soft chewable foods that can be uh, in your st stage the macaronis okay which can go the small pieces in us we have the khichdis which is there which is made up of rice okay at 60 you the dry crackers can be bite upon and they can swallow it back then by 70 again small cuts of um, the vegetables which are there, there but they are overcooked that can be gulped in as well as at the score of 80 all the meats which are there because you know chewing it requires a mechanical chewing of uh, the uh, the poultry which is there and 90 and 10 is the ones where they can tolerate the full full diet of the normal different varied texture which is there okay so that's the reason in case when you come and uh, when you're reading a report just to reiterate and the the swallowing therapist has written the score as hnc uh, um, uh, the pss hnc score as 10 then the patient will say i'm drinking water i'm drinking clear fluid but you should understand that there is a high risk of aspiration and immediately you can counsel the patient that you know placing an enteral tube a rails tube will be better for you you know for acceptance and and easy going of the food otherwise there can be risk of choking and then you can send that patient back to your doctor okay for insertion of the tube 
Then another condition further ahead as we move from head and neck towards esophagus also is the Kyle's leak, okay, which might require, which can also occur during your enteral feeding. So the Kyle's leak, this is a very, uh, this is a very rare surgical complication, and this condition occurs in less than one percent of the thyroidectomy, and about eight percent of the head and neck cancers surgeries. Okay, it is a post-surgery complication which happens. So the Kyle leak can also happen in the abdominal surgeries as well as uh, the chest uh, chest or any even at times in nephrectomy so chyle basically it is a milky fluid which uh, consists of the lymph or the interstitial fluid and the emulsified fat and uh, the leak it is a uh, hole okay that allows the uh, accidental escape of this fluid outside okay so then the chyle leak will be uh, the loss of milky fluid that is chyle which is rich in proteins um fluids and electro uh, and um elect uh, electrolytes okay so it consists the chyles consist of one to three percent of the composed of the triglycerides then 70 percent of the long chain three percent of the proteins there are electrolyte content same which is of the plasma except there are low calcium concentration and the the t lymphocytes okay and the daily production of your uh, chyles will again depend upon the diet and the dietary intake okay so they, this can lead to a fluid dis, uh, depletion in case if your output increases okay and uh, malnutrition with a high output if it is not uh, rectified or resolved okay so the clinical characteristics will be again it is uh, intraoperative or postoperative the drain of the milky white the drains will be measured the patient will be nil by mouth or the patient will be referred to the dietitian for a fat free rather a fat restricted diet that's a better word and uh, may uh, uh, be present with a leak or a clear fluid which is there so we as dietitian as we plan also every day in a follow up we should also monitor the drains and also see the appearance of the drain from milky it should go to transparent okay or it can become serious bloody so then we know that the the chylomicrons are decreasing Okay, there is the volume of the drainage. Again, we need to monitor that is less than 500 ml per day is a lesser volume, which is called as a low output fistula volume. And more than that is obviously a high output. And in case if it goes there more than 1000, then enteral also cannot be considered. We need to go to a TPN. Okay, so what will be the investigations that you will look upon? It will be usually an analysis of the triglycerides report. So the chyle contains two to eight times of the amount of the triglyceride as compared to your normal TG levels. So your, your value of the normal TG levels, it will be greater than 110 mg per dl. Okay, so that can be in case if it is sent by the chyle is tested and it is sent by your doctor. So that's how you will mark it okay and the so the treatment will be a conservative treatment because it, you have to see that the drain has to come uh, less than 500 ml uh, of the chyles per day so for that you can keep the head, head elevated okay so the uh, due to the gravity uh, the drain is not that much uh, even in case if the wound is there then is closed wound drainage should be used and suction drainage there are suction containers which are there which through the gravity will start pulling up so it gets collected pressure dressings are used and then is you have to replace the fluid which is lost through the fistula which can reach up to four liters per day okay and for the y'all we we dietitians have to plan a fat restricted diet which is less than 10 to 20 grams of uh, fat per day and therefore we can use the mct based fat which is there okay and um, uh, that is or, or uh, these are also there in your elemental formulas so the mct oil does not uh, prevent the, uh, this um, the essential fatty acid deficiency so we have to see that we do not exceed more than 12 to 18 mct uh, teaspoons of mct oil per day okay this is basically um for you all to understand that is uh, if you go to see the normal 95 uh, percent of the fat that we uh, uh, ingest is triglyceride along with the long chain um, fatty acids which is there so what happens is uh, these fats are re-esterified into the mucus cell of our uh, uh, bowel wall and they get combined with an apoprotein and a uh, phospholipid and they are transported to the lymphatic system as the chylomicrons okay so that's how the chylomicrons keep on 
coming through the lymphatic system and that's the drain that is a uh, milky drain which comes but in 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 the mcts as we know uh, what happens that is they're directly absorbed into the portal vein without the formation of these chylomicrons okay and so they bypass the lymphatic system fine so then one another condition is uh, it is very rare especially in case if it's yours is an oncology setup then you will be seeing these cases which is called as the TEP. So this is a uh, tracheoesophageal uh, puncture, which is done. It is an incision, which is done at the trachea uh, through the esophagus for a laryngectomy patient. It is basically for the voice processes. When the, uh, the voice box is removed, you know, so then that's the reason for that it is being kept. So it is uh, made with an eventual placement of the voice processes. Mm -hmm. And to keep the inc incision site open, a catheter that is, which is called as the red uh, Robinson, is placed through the tract of the esophagus, passed down through the stomach. You might get these patients, you know. So that's the reason I just want to sensitize you all. So this tube can also be used for feeding purposes if required. So basically, the process will be same as you go uh, with a, a nasogastric tube or uh, the peg feed as we give okay but see that you strain all the feeds and give okay then so what i need to say is in hedonic cancers you have uh, that is either pre-operative or post-operative or during the chemo and radiation again depending upon your condition and the status after evaluation an ngt can be placed and in case if uh, uh, you require a prolonged uh, time that is more than four weeks to go in then it will be preferred if a peg insertion is done and in these uh, patients, you can give uh, uh, very easily, comfortably a bolus feed, which is there. Bolus feeding can be given. Or in case at times, we can give the uh, slow drip method. Okay, that is the feed is kept into the bag. And by slow drip, intermittent, intermittent feeds, it can be given. Okay, so the advantages of the NG, PEG and TP will be, that is the patient can sit at one place and finish the feed uh, in few minutes okay that is uh, it can tolerate almost everything in liquid forms it can take feeds almost you can take it everywhere because uh, in our setup the patients come to the hospital right from the morning till evening and they're visiting a lot of clinics okay so then they can take it at the hospital opds at home in case if they are traveling if there is a long distance travel which is there it is less complicated and uh, the feeds can be go given either bolus it can be given intermittent or it can be given in a continuous drip method. Then we come to the NJ feedings. Okay, so the type, the NJ feedings, it can be due to, it can be in conditions where there is delayed gastric emptying, where there is profuse nausea and vomiting. Okay, in conditions where, surgical condition where there is esophagectomy done. So uh, that is where the esophag, the part of the esophagus which is affected with this cancer is removed and it is attached to the stomach or at times if uh, uh, there can be a gastric pull up which is done at this case okay where uh, the the entire esophagus is removed and the stomach is pulled up okay uh, which makes uh, which starts functioning as a esophagus so your you might require a prolonged ng feed which is given then we may also require into gastrectomy okay that is a partial gastrectomy where the part of the stomach is removed and the jejunum is attached and there is a uh, total gastrectomy the entire stomach is removed okay as well uh, in the whipple's procedure also where uh, you might require um, ng um, feeding to be started post operatively okay then there is there are also certain conditions where uh, uh, there can be an obstruction, a biliary obstruction, and uh, you know where you cannot, uh, you cannot even pass an NJT or a JT. Uh, it is very um, rare, but even NJT cannot be passed. So here, what they do is, uh, uh, you might see this opaque tube. So that's the reason, uh, just to emphasize, uh, you have to give a jejunostomy feed to this patient, and this is uh, placed only through radiation it cannot be manually placed so ir guided it is and it is uh, uh, the tube which is usually put is uh, the um, uh, is a nasal uh, biliary uh, 
drainage catheter which is there okay which acts as a tube which is there so you can just see the french size the tube is very small so through this not even your ba feeding back catheters uh, the the outlet can be inserted so you have to take a 50 cc syringe to put uh, the feeds into it so you have to see that they are um, you know soluble feeds and uh, you have to strain the feeds try uh, two to three times properly and small frequent frequent feeds have to be given uh, to these patients okay so the points to be remembered for jejunostomy feeding will be that is you the feed should only be in a propped up position for about 30 degrees to be given and never feed the patient in sitting position so if the feed is uh, not passing through the feeding bag then the regulator has a problem and it needs to be changed or checked okay cannot tolerate many feeds uh, so then they can be lactose it can be a high osmolar feed uh, and polymeric feeds can be there so you may have to alter the choice then is knee, the uh, you, uh, the patient also needs a comfortable bed positioning to feed therefore cannot feed anywhere except at places where the facility is available then is there are chances of complications here the patient might increase the infusion rate or the relative if he doesn't know that it has to if it's intermittent feed going on and there can be osmotic diarrhea then is uh, you can feed uh, in bolus and you have to feed in intermittent or continuous again but depending upon how it has been prescribed so in the perioperative stage in weight losing patients uh, due to insufficient nutritional intake the enteral nutrition should be provided to improve and maintain the nutritional status and the patients with severe uh, nutritional risk may benefit from the nutritional support 10 to 14 days prior to major surgeries and uh, even um, in case of the surgery has been delayed so this is right at the time of screening you have to see that you know you may tell the patient in case if you understand that the patient is supposed to go out for a surgery it will be better that the patient comes for a nutrition counseling and for nutritional status you know you can build that patient in 14 days and then talk to the doctor that he can be uh, given the uh, operation date okay so then uh, there are few nutritional issues in surgical patients that is in case if there is an abnormal transit just to understand i've just made it into a table so in, there'll be a dumping syndrome so early dumping syndrome can be uh, within an hour's time so there can be diarrhea or the patient may say he's feeling bloated okay through an njt tube in case in cases like uh, esophagus cases or uh, the ca stomach cases so there, there can be nausea there can be trachycardia and uh, immediately after 30 minutes after a meal and in late there can be hypoglycemic symptoms he'll start perspiring or the patient might feel dizzy that is 90 to 180 minutes after the meals so what you can do is during this time try don't give bolus you try to give intermittent slow drip method then is reduce uh, see the content of the feed that you're giving if it's kitchen feed or it is uh, your supplements which are going the simple carbs have to be removed and see that the fat content is also reduced okay and then is increased on the soluble fiber which is there in the feeds then is a, a reflux esophagitis that is there can be a regurgitation of the food and digestive juices which can cause heart burns and nausea and vomiting so again you give intermittent feeds uh, or by slow drip method and you, antacids can be used if there is delayed gastric emptying or gastric stasis then early satiety will happen there can be postprandial fullness heart burns dysphagia and there can be risk of aspiration also so again you have to give intermittent uh, 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 slow drip method feeds see the fiber content it has to be moderate and the doctor can you know prescribe prokinetic agents then if in the if there is a pancreatocebal a chronosis which is there so again it is manifested as tetoria okay uh, there'll be um, uh, uh, there'll be uh, uh, floating stools, pouch swelling, which has uh, very bulky, oily stools, which are there, uh, and frequent greasy stools, which are seen. Okay, so here again, pancreatic enzyme supplementation. Just see whether the doctor has prescribed or not, and supplementation of micronutrients, that is your fat soluble vitamins, calcium, vitamin D, also has to be considered. Okay, then is uh, malasemiasis, that is, if there is reduction in the intake impaired absorption and increased losses so there can be a micronutrient deficiency which can set up so of course enteral feeds are given if not we have to switch to parenteral to come 
and again pa pancreatic uh, enzyme supplementation will uh, has to be given and again the nutrient hey, uh, supplementation hello hi i just wanted to point out it's yeah. another 40 minute mark okay 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 fine fine and depending upon the nutrient malabsorption okay then there is uh, obstructions uh, that is again in case if there is gastric outlet complexion uh, there will be vomiting and um, uh, there will be constipation back again either enteral or parenteral has to be considered okay and uh, there is pro motility agents can be given and in pancreatic insufficiency uh, insufficiency there will be steatorrhea or bloating and again pancreatic enzymes or replacement uh, uh, should be given so the contraindications for enteral tube feeding in the oncology setup will be bowel obstruction the patient has uh, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable if there is uh, intractable diarrhea continuous that is due to this is due to the uh, chemotoxicities which is there there can be severe bleeding there can be ischemia or there is perforation of the gut okay then is if there is high output fistula or the ostomy out, uh, output is also high more than um, uh, 500 ml to go in there is extensive resectioning of the sm small bowel or there is significant proportion of the small bowel not being function and need of 100 cm jejunum and uh, 150 uh, cm ileus with an ileocecal valve for adequate gi absorption of the nutrients so back again the importance of the nutritional support will be because the the nutritional uh, assessment is very very important uh, to um, uh, evaluate the performance and the quality life of these patients and so the influence of the nutritional intervention will be on oncology treatment okay that is whether it is curative or whether it is palliative so in curative the nutritional intervention will aim on a reduced number of complications and shortening the recovery phase whereas in palliative the aim will be on nutritional interventions aim will be to sustain and to enhance the recovery of the patient's performance every day okay and their well being and their quality of life okay so uh, how and the quality of life right so uh, as the there are various guidelines which has emphasized on um, how we have to go about is that regardless of the body mass and index the screening of the patients is very very important and regular rescreening of the nutritional status is also has to be considered okay you can take in any of the validative screening tools which are there which will fit into your organization then is increase the nutritional assessment uh, to include that is to measure the anorexia body composition the inflammatory markers which are there okay as well as the uh, resting energy expenditure and physical functioning and increasing nutritional intake that is you have to focused on individualized planning by uh, increasing the nutritional intake decreasing the inflammation the hyper uh, uh, the hyper metabolic uh, stress which is there and also increasing the physical activity so you may pick up any of the validated screening tools which are there which is the malnutrition screening tool or the must which is malnutrition universal screening tool you are the nrs 2020 uh, 2002 you you for the elderly you have the mini nutritional assessment uh, which is there and for the assessment you have the subjective global assessment or the patient generated subjective global assessment so once you find the patient as at risk you need to go for the nutritional needs and the requirements of the patient so there are various guidelines which have been listed here which will help you to which will guide you to help to plan your diet but ultimately the call is on you when you will be Uh, seeing the case specificity what your patient is going every day what is the status of the patient and then planning the required amount of calories and proteins okay so as it says uh, that is the indirect calorimetry appears to be the most accurate uh, but if the uh, resting energy expenditure uh, and the total energy expenditure cannot be measured directly you can take in 25 to 30 kcals per kg per uh, per day as the requirement and for proteins it can be around 1.2 to 1.5 grams of proteins per kg per day okay this is uh, to help in maintain or restore the lean body mass and it has also been proposed that the uh, the start, uh, the guidelines have said that is even a higher dose of protein may be necessary in case of the depletion is severe in severely depleted patients the feeding should be initiated slowly over several days okay uh, while carefully monitoring the phosphate and electrolytes they just 
seeing that there should not be any refeeding syndrome. And in weight losing cancer patients with insulin resistance, uh, there is pen guidelines which is say that is increase the ratio of fat and carbohydrate calories. So there is so increase the energy density of your diets to reduce the glycemic load. So just to uh, you know collate, I have just shown you all the various guidelines as they say that around 25 to 30 k cals per kg body weight can be initially started for the cancer patients. Okay, as well as for the proteins. That is, you can start with 1.2 to 2 grams also, depending upon the requirement and your case specificity. For the vitamins and trace elements, adequate amount of appropriate equal to uh, should be there for the RDA. And to discourage the higher doses of micronutrients in absence of any specific defi uh, deficiency. At times, do, uh, we don't even say that because they, it can be, you know, it can lead a drug and in, uh, nutrient interaction. So it can be a mega dose in case uh, the patient is going through a chemotherapy, which is there. So it's better to give them through the natural sources. Okay, and yes, the immunonutrients, that is your omega-3, uh, omega-3, uh, your glutamine and arginine are also important because they improve in your lean body mass, they reduce the infection complications, they help in wound healing, they prevent uh, the, uh, uh, the treatment which is related to diarrhea and uh, uh, mucositis, they restore organ function and improve the overall clinical outcomes. So the types of formula will be basically an intact polymeric generally uh, it suits all so use of a standard formula is advised perioperative that is use of uh, enteral nutrition uh, preferably with the immunomodulator substrate that is your arginine n3 uh, the your omega-3 uh, nucleotide it is advisable that you may start five to seven days even 14 days is much more better depending upon your practical setup okay which will uh, in case in the patients who are undergoing abdominal your gi tract surgeries Okay, and during uh, during the stem cell transplant, enteral administration of glutamine or um, the EPA, uh, it'll it is not recommended uh, due to uh, inconclusive data, right? Just to emphasize one of the complications that is how will you uh, how will you um, evaluate for the refeeding syndrome is that is uh, the nice guidelines has given this in case of the patient is at risk. Okay, so presence of any of these two characters that is in case of the bmi is less than 16 kg per meter and uh, uh, the square, uh, square that is unintentional weight loss of more than 15 percent in the last three to six months if there is little or no nutritional intake for more than 10 days or there are low levels of your uh, uh, your potassium phosphorus and magnesium before the feeds or else the bmi is less than 18.5 uh, there is unintentional weight loss of more than 10% uh, in the last three to six days. Little or no uh, nutritional uh, intake for more than five days or 10 uh, days. And there is a history of alcohol abuse or drug uh, um, which includes insulin uh, or your CT um, antacids and diuretics which are there. So what will you do? You will correct the electrolytes and thymine uh, needs to be started before the feeds. Okay, as even Salome Ma'am had uh, had mentioned that in her lecture, the first lecture that we covered, then it start slow drip method at, at a very slow rate, that is at the rate of 20 ml per hour, increasing gradually to 60 ml after every 12 hours. Observe for BP, your heart rate, pulse, and any uncomfortable reactions seen during the, the feeding phase, and give a break of one hour after every four hours of the feed. And last, just to emphasize the metabolic complications in case what will you do in case this happens so in case if there is diarrhea so the possible cause will be an inadequate uh, so Kuda, if i can get you stay five minutes because these are practical tips um, okay. yeah uh, so um, so in case if uh, uh, there is any inadequate free water administration it can be due to fluid losses or the, it can be due to concentrated formula in your internal feed so what you will do is you will increase the fluid water internally that is, you have to monitor the input-output chart daily along with the weight daily and bring to an isocaloric feed, that is one kilocal uh, per ml. Then is, in case if there is over uh, hydration, then is, it may be due to refeeding syndrome or excess fluid intake. So you have to decrease the free water flushes which are there and obviously mon daily monitor the input-output and the weight. If there is hyperglycemia, it can be due to your diabetes, insulin resistance, they can be due to sepsis or it can be due to steroids. So you have to change the composition, the carbohydrate control and uh, 
you or you may uh, incorporate a fiber containing formula and use or adjust to the insulin dosage or uh, the OHAs which are given. Then is in case of there is hypernatremia, it may be due to inadequate free water or excess fluid losses like diuresis. So you have to in, in the the possible correction will be increase the free water, monitor the fluids daily, input output and the weight, and consider if you can change to a lower EN formula of sodium. Okay. And uh, then is uh, hyponatremia, that is, uh, there's water retention. Uh, it can be due to fluid overload. There can be sodium losses due to the GI uh, problems. There can be even SAIDH. So again, for this, you need to change uh, to lower free uh, water formulas, restrict the fluid or the free water and supplement with sodium. Hypokalemia, again, refeeding syndrome, it can be due to excess GI losses, diuresis, or there can be dialysis, which is going on or inadequate intake okay so what you can do is decrease the feed up to 25 percent of the targeted goal the infusion that you're giving and replace uh, the potassium and then evaluate the need uh, to change the en formula if possible then is hyperphosphatemia again it can be due to either kidney insufficiency or kidney failure there can be tumorlysis syndrome as a possible cause or phosphate containing antacids which may be given to the patients so consider changing it to a low phosphorus EN formula and uh, recommend is that phosphate binders are recommended and change in the medications which the doctors will do. And hypophosphatemia, uh, there can be refitting syndrome, insulin therapy or phosphate containing antacid. The decrease again here, you're feeding by 25% and there is a correction and you have to replace uh, phosphate, uh, not potassium and uh, change the medication if possible, right? Whereas in the GI, uh, complications in case if there is a high gastric as, uh, residue please do not stop your feeds it may be due to delayed gastric emptying and large volume so obviously switch on to post pyloric feeding prokinetic can be advised okay and considering changing of the concentration of the feeds with a lower infusion rate in case if there is aspiration or reflux then is again uh, you must be giving the the position of the bed is very much important so what you can do is uh, elevate the head of the bed at 30 to, uh, 30 to 40 degrees Celsius. Use a small bore tube, which we just, uh, which I showed you, the uh, blue one which is there. Then is, uh, there can be continuous feeding from bolus to be shifted there. And then is consider adding of prokinetic. In case if there is nausea, vomiting, uh, or there is abdominal distension or bloating, then again, uh, you know, continuous feeding method should be considered with low fat or isotonic formulas. Then is again uh, put in prokinetic uh, agents which are there. Consider changing the post pyloric feeding. Use anti emetic and initiate the feed at a very low rate and then gradually advance. Diarrhea, of course, first rule out what is the cause. Okay, so it can be due to um, the usage of sorbitol in case of it's there because it's hyperosmolar due to any laxatives or lactulose. Then is evaluate the use of antibiotics. Okay. Uh, then is also you can see the stool culture because there can be infection. Then is if there can be bacterial contamination. So please see how the feed is made. What is the hang time? Because for powdered formulas, it is only four hours. Then is you may change even see if, if it is an NJ feed, if the bags for feed are washed or changed or not. Okay. And then you can go into the closed system formulas to come in. Then is change the fiber content of the EN feed and uh, you can, in case of there is malabsorption, then you can change to elemental or elemental formula. In case of this tutoria, then um, you may change to MCT based formula, which is there. And last constipation, uh, in case uh, the main cause will be adequate fluid intake. So you have to increase the free water and the fluid intake. Then is uh, you can consider a change in the uh, fiber of the content of the EN formula increase the act physical activity in case of pop mobilize the patient okay then is minimize a narcotic because narcotics also leads to constipation the drugs so uh, even at times the depress uh, the patient who are uh, on antidepressant they also lead to constipation then is stool softeners and laxative and evaluate the cause as per that might be need uh, need to hold because in case of there is gi obstruction then we have to hold the enteral uh, the ng uh, enteral feeding which is there so just to summarize the points to be remembered that will be uh, for while feeding will be feed the feeding should be at room temperature sterile equipments and utensils uh, should be used while preparing 
keep the patient in the propped up position that is 45 degrees for ngt and 30 degrees for ngt keep che checking the infusion rates they should not change okay uh, then is if the feeding is not uh, passing through the patient then is the patient needs to change the positioning then is flush the tube with clean water before and after the feeds you may consult uh, the pharmacist for the medical ad administration that is how it has to go through the tube start the first feed on time so for a better for compliance of the patient then is personal hygiene of the patient is very very important as well as of the nurse well whoever is giving the feed maintain oral hygiene okay keep patients uh, motivated because they keep on having the same feeds you know so you know they might then the compliance might come down uh, keep the patient mo uh, mobile in between the feeds check on any infections which are there in case of there if there is any bleeding then immediately tell your doctor and the nurses should also be trained what are the type and sizes of the tubes which are there so to summarize uh, that is to practice safe internal feeding, uh, feeding uh, as the Aspen standard says, be alert. That is, you have to maintain aseptic techniques, label the internal equipments, if, uh, elevate the bed positioning, see that the right patient gets the right formula at the right time and the, with the right tube. Okay, and trace all the lines and tubing back to the patient. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive coverage of the topic and especially for the tips that you covered in the end that were really very useful. So I'm going to straight off jump to the panel discussion. Uh, I would like to invite all the panelists as well to join us in the discussion. So we've already met our speaker today, Ms. Purvi Mahajan. Our next panelist is Ms. A. Rajeshwari. She's a senior clinical dietitian and head of the department at Department of Dietetics, Apollo Cancer Center. She has over 20 years of clinical experience. She has an MSc and she's an RD with a, and a PhD scholar. She has won several awards for presenting her research work at different conferences. She's also co-authored a book for dietitians uh, on basics of clinical nutrition for adults, pediatric, and beyond basics in transplant nutrition. Welcome, Ms. Rajeshwari. Our next panelist is Dr. Estes Satyaraj. She's head clinical nutrition and dietetics at CG Hospital in Bengaluru. She has a PhD in nutrition from one of the prestigious institutes in India, National Institute of Nutrition, Hyderabad. Over 15 years of clinical experience, and she has had past experience of working with several different hospitals in oncology has published over 10 papers in national and international journals and also has experience in NABH quality improvement projects and Six Sigma projects in healthcare. Welcome, Ms. Uh, Dr. Esther. Our next speaker is from Kenya. He is Mr. Robert Kemboy. He's a nutrition officer number three at Kenyatta National Hospital in Kenya. He has a bachelor's degree of technology in human nutrition from Technical University of Kenya and has worked as a tutor, tutor at Nairobi Aviation College, also has a nutrition attach, attachment at MOA Technical and Referral Hospital, and he's been at Kenyatta National Hospital from 2019 to date. He's worked in oncology wards and has worked on 23 different types of cancer as well. Welcome, Mr. Robert. Um, our, we had one more panelist on board, uh, Dr. Agnes, but she could not join us today due to an emergency. May I request all the panelists to post on your cameras? So I'll, I think begin with Dr. Esther. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I think we've covered a lot about malnutrition today, and you know, uh, Ms. Purbi wonderfully covered that aspect. Cancer-related malnutrition can evolve into cancer cachexia, and due to a lot of the complex interactions that we see in terms of cytokines and the host metabolism. So is cancer cachexia preventable in all types of cancer? And if not, then how do we manage it better from the nutrition standpoint? Thanks, thanks, Okata. So uh, cancer, in one of the slides that Surubi had shown, uh, there are there is a definition of cancer cachexia, which is very, very difficult for us to follow in practical terms. But uh, if you want to classify cancer cachexia, it comes in at a pre cachexic stage, cachexia, and then a refractory cachexia. So if we see a patient who is in a refractory cachexia where the 
uh, there is uh, severe muscle wasting as well as body um, you know weight has dropped to more than 10 percent then uh, reversing that becomes extremely challenging uh, if we see patients in a more of a pre cachexic stage and the clinical outcomes are still good then uh, you know going aggressive with nutrition support and trying to uh, you know delay or prevent uh, onset of cachexia is definitely evidenced and recommended uh, the goal in this is screening patients. The reason why dietitians come in later or we end up seeing patients more in a refractory cachexia stage is because we don't have good screening protocols. So we don't really understand uh, where the weight uh, was when the diagnosis was uh, made and what the weight is at the time of you know, uh, chemotherapy or radiation or after multiple sessions. Uh, so by the time uh, you know they understand they you know understand that patient has lost a lot of weight, we would have lost a lot of time to build the patient up. So um, emphasizing on screening protocols so that we can recognize uh, cachexia early definitely helps. Thank you for that, um, Ms. Rajeshwari. Would you like to add anything from your experience on this? Uh, uh, I first of all I want to thank um, the Hexagon Nutrition and uh, it is a really wonderful session actually what Purabi was uh, having it up and uh, as uh, Esther was uh, initiating about it actually it is very critical to find a patient who is initially at the uh, at the stage of cachectic where the patient have weight loss or something like that because normally when you check a patient where they have monitored the weight in, uh, on a weekly basis they, they would have not done it actually honestly speaking. Uh, probably after initiating the treatment process, yes, they, it's, it is a must for them to check the weight uh, on a regular daily basis, on a weekly basis, they'll be doing it. Otherwise, they would have not monitored is there any weight deviation they have noticed earlier or is there any deviation on their uh, food intake or anything like that. When we recall their food intake, probably they'll be could able to recollect and tell, yes, there was a minimal, you know, food intake has been reduced and they have noticed certain weight loss. But most of the clients, yes, they would have not noticed the weight changes. Initial phase, it is not happening at all. But when if it is after the, in case of uh, treatment procedure, uh, as really Esther said, we can able to, you know, uh, revert back the weight changes. We can, with the help of oral nutrition support, yes, we can do the patient's uh, you know, uh, from the cachectic, we can bring back to the normal stage. It is a reversible process. We can it able can to be do treated. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can be treated. So apart from the weight, do you use any specific markers in your practice to understand the impact of either um, the state of malnutrition or the therapy that you're offering the patient? See, actually, um, uh, apart from the uh, uh, treatment point, right, it can be chemotherapy or radiotherapy or something like that. Uh, the main, the first and for, for foremost thing is because most of the clinical examination, like uh, biochemical parameters, they are not doing it honestly. Uh, it is only for a, uh, when they come for a chemotherapy, yes, they'll be doing it. Yes, it's a must criteria that has been included. And moreover, in the main criteria, what they include is the hemoglobin level. They'll be monitoring it up. Your lymphocytes and your platelets, they'll be monitoring to it. Apart from that, sodium and potassium. And if and that too, if in case of a patient's uh, food intake level has been reduced, uh, then only it has been in, reinforced on checking the sodium and potassium level. Otherwise, uh, they won't be no, noting it down. The main criteria Area, it is the hemoglobin and total iron binding capacity, the platelets and the lymphocytes levels they'll be and the platelet levels they'll be monitoring it up. So that will be one major uh, thing they'll be noting it down. Apart from that, I, we have to uh, as uh, uh, you know we have to assist the patients uh, initially at the time of admission or at the OPD if the patient comes in uh, with the uh, help of any, any nutritional assessment tool. We need to assist the patient at the earliest. We can find out whether the patient is well nourished or moderately malnourished or severely malnourished. And as much as possible, we can intervene with the oral nutrition support and we can revert back the weight as much as possible. So correlation of the weight, the dietary intake and the biochemical parameters is very essential. It's very essential, actually. Right. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Robert, the next question is for you. Um, in your practice, do you use immune nutrition for your patients? And... Um, it can be provided either as an immune, immunonutrient enriched formula or a single immunonutrient of just glutamine or just arginine. Um, 
or it could be a combination of immunonutrient molecules along with protein. So what is your preference and what is your experience in different kinds of cancers that you have seen at Kenyatta? You're on mute, Mr. Robert. Okay, thank you so much, the panelist and um, the, the Hexaco Nutrition for giving us this platform for interaction. Yeah, however, um, in my practice, we have some gaps that exist in our practice. And uh, maybe one of them is what Dr. Esther said about the, the biochemical parameters of interest, especially the liver test function, the UECs. But you find that uh, most of the oncologists go for full hemogram as opposed to the other biochemical markers that shows the nutrition status of the patient. However, um, now back to your question about the immuno, immunonutrition, which are um, provided to this patient so that they can take care of um, the immunity. Um, here at uh, Kenyatta, um, the, the nutrition aspect of managing the patient is fully um, given to the nutritionist. Uh, being there uh, to gather the needs of these patients, we have some enteral formulas being provided, which are evidence-based. Some contain uh, glutamine combined with uh, zinc and selenium, while the others have uh, both glutamine, arginine, um, and also zinc, selenium, and molybdenum, which are immune modulants that is used to build up the immunity of this patient. And alongside that, it's not that uh, we, are, uh, we are targeting the immune system, but we are also providing the nutrients, which uh, also uh, perform other tasks apart from immunity. That is um, providing, uh, the, uh, what do we call this? Breakdown of, uh, of the food substances. For example, the glutamines, which, are, uh, which assist in Gluconeogenesis, that's actually a breakdown uh, formation of, of uh, glucagon from the substrate, hence making this uh, individual to have that muscles. We have also arginine. Uh, arginine, which also plays an important role uh, in maintaining the normal function of the cardiovascular, how our systems work. Remember, uh, the first panel talked about the cytokines. At the same time, we, in cancer patients, we have, um, we have tumor necrotic factor. These tumor necrotic factor are responsible for uh, binding the ion, which are in food, hence making it not available for the body. And therefore, most of these oncology patients, some um, get to a stage of anema, anemic, which uh, most physicians recommend transfusion. Um, we have also um, gluta, um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, that's omega acids. We are using a seven C's here. And also we, we are providing food, especially uh, fish that uh, will cater for uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. Uh, this actually helps to reduce now the breakdown of muscles, which uh, at the end, far end, the patient will get to a stage of cachexia. And now we want to control and consolidate that the muscles of these patients are maintained so that we cannot uh, encroach um, close to cachexia. Um, we have also uh, uh, the other one like taurine, uh, nucleotides, Apart from being antioxidants, it also helps uh, in processing energy for these patients. And especially these patients are always, they have, um, um, I, I think one of the cause of um, loss of appetite is also psychological. Because when the news are broken down to this patient that you have cancer, psychologically, they will be disturbed and how our bodies work it produces some stress hormones, which will facilitate massive breakdown of body tissues, hence leading to What's your experience of immunonutrition when mucositis? 
or uh, Ms. Purvi spoke about perioperative use of immunonutrition. Uh, do you do you happen to use that in that form in your practice for mucous um, oral And I would like some other panelists as well on this. What is your experience of immunonutrition in oral mucositis? Can you hear me? Um, currently, with um, with patients who have mucositis, we also we we we, we tailor their food into um, a, a, a simple, with a good consistency, so that they cannot have problems in chewing, uh, have deep bruises. We make the consistent those uh, in in a, in a way that they can ease swallowing. Then uh, the, the same patients are put on antibiotics so that can, they can prevent them from uh, infection. For patients who, have, who are diabetic, these patients, their sugars are monitored uh, and also they are on uh, insulin therapy. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Robert. Uh, Ms. Purpi, would you like to add anything based on? Yeah, uh, if you, uh, if the question was for mucositis as well as the immunonutrient, yes, glutamine. If you go to see the literature, RCTs, there is a lot of contra, uh, indication, contradictions which are there, which they say that, you know, it, it doesn't help or it says. But if you go to see practical experience, it does. Uh, especially, uh, you know, glutamine as such through uh, the, the, uh, the uh, even the others can even, uh, you know, add on because uh, the glutamine per se as a monocomponent which is there as well as the zinc and selenium products which are available along with that. So if you go to see according to how much it has been, we do practice that. So our pract uh, practically that is uh, uh, according to how much they say that is around 0 0.3 to uh, 0 0.6 gram per kg as it has been given and it gets incorporated into a diet. It shows a very good effect within 14 days. It does practically. So a practice, your case specific practice, it does help you. Though the research evidences are not still that much supportive. Okay. Would you like to add your experiences? Maybe I can yeah. add one. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, as uh, what Purabi was telling, actually, we have lots of clinical uh, studies, it's been done. But the thing is, evidence, still the yes. data, we are not having a lack of data, we are not having that much of thing, we are not having it to it. But uh, yes, it has been, uh, it has been earlier days, yes, initially, they were treated mucositis with the use of glutamine and that too, uh, uh, you know, uh, a person with a combination of zinc, they, and, uh, they, have, com they have used it for the treating mucositis. So the, it has shown a very good result but current data what the 2021 um, aspen aspen guidelines were recommending is like uh, it it has a it, it the it causes the relapse in the tumor so that is the reason why it is why we are not having a sufficient amount of data as it has not been having to it uh, and still it has been a contraindicated in can in treating a cancer patients that's what yeah. So would you would you recommend uh, so I think I saw in your bio as well that you won an award for the immunonutrition uh, in head and neck cancer. So what would you like to share a little bit of that experience as well? Yeah. Uh, sure. Actually, uh, uh, as a uh, thing, actually, we have uh, been at cancer hospital. Uh, most of us will be having we have a, the window period what we generally say for a treating for a patient who comes for a the window period will be very lesser so that's the reason where, where we couldn't able to you know emphasize or we have to uh, you know reinforce the nutritional status for a patient who is being planned for a emergency surgical intervention uh, if it are pl planned interventions yes probably we right now we have started doing it we started on oral nutrition support we emphasize on nutrition uh, 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 importance for the patient and then we are making the patient fit for the surgeries but early days we are not having to it but what we have started doing is the post-operative phase we started initiating the immune nutrition supplement and that too with the combination of arginine and uh, immune nutrient uh, with zinc and other products we have suggested the first five to seven days of immune supplementation had shown a great impact on the outcome the clinical outcome it has reduced the uh, you know, length of hospital stay and the high ICU stay and moreover the complication rate has also been reduced hardly one or two patients had minimal complications not a greater uh, level we never have noticed to it and moreover the hospital readmission rate also we have monitored 
uh, for a month of three months and six months we have noticed they had come for further treatment purpose but not as such a complication we have not noticed it so in our practice yes immune nutrition supplementation uh, post operative yes it has been shown a clinical impact on it uh, pre operative yes we have if we have an window period yes it it will be having a very good result which will be shown to us that's what yeah, yeah. thank Doctor, I said there's some evidence building up apart from immunonutrition about use of ERAS protocol in patients going for cancer surgery as well, right? So, what is your experience with this, and what are some of the challenges that we faced with following the ERAS protocol? Uh, because that came up in the last couple of sessions when we were discussing as well. Uh, on paper, ERAS protocol looks very good and you know promising, but it's not really always possible for us to do it in practice. Yeah, good point. Uh, so ERAS protocol evidence, a lot of evidence to support it um, has to is emphasized in uh, not just cancer surgeries, but all types of surgeries has been documented to improve outcomes. Um, it is challenging, but not impossible. Um, a few things that, uh, that Rajeshwari said is, you know, if we have a protocol for post-operative care, uh, if we, you know, set up a similar protocol for a pre-operative care, then it kind of helps. So uh, my experience, if I'm supposed to, if I can add, we didn't uh, start off with all the cancer surgeries, but we started off with head and neck uh, cancer surgeries where we, because head and neck and GI are the most vulnerable for malnutrition. So head and neck cancer surgeries, we had this uh, protocol set that as soon as the surgery is planned, the patient at the OPD level itself is referred to the nutritionist for screening. Now, our screening goes into body composition analysis with a simple screening tool and intervention is done. Uh, we don't have many days. One of the challenges is ERAS protocol says 10 days, 14 days. Practically, it doesn't work that way. We But... There are also studies that say that even if you can intervene for three to seven days, the, the outcomes are still good. Uh, the benefit here is we can at least understand whether the patient, when they are coming in itself, are malnourished or nutritionally at risk or well-nourished. Now, considering HCG is a more of a corporate center, our segment of patients, when they come in, uh, they are not severely malnourished. Okay, so even a three days of pre-op intervention, uh, I can do. Uh, and if I have a patient who is severely malnourished, that is coming in with, you know, a very low BMI, a, a significant weight loss, then the surgeon does give me time. But that proportion is less in my in my uh, center. It will be different uh, for Purubi, I mean, for, uh, you know, for other uh, centers. Uh, but my center, the proportion of patients who come in severely malnourished at the time of uh, surgery is not too much. So for me, I have a gap of three to five days before the surgery comes in. And three to five days, we screen them, put them on an immunonutrition pre-op plan. Surgery is done. Early enteral nutrition, I think that is established across India uh, by many of the surgeons. So early enteral nutrition, so within the first 72 hours, the feeds start. Uh, and Discharge happens within the seven, uh, within five to seven days post-op. First follow-up happens at the OPD level. And post-operative follow-up is, is uh, designed by us, similar to what Rajeshwari had spoken. So we schedule the post-operative follow-up. Most of the head and neck patients come back for radiation therapy. So we have a gap of three to four weeks after surgery to build them up. And that three to four weeks, we don't miss. So we, you know, we are very, very uh, particular that they follow up with us. Now, we did this for head and neck, saw good results. Paper is in publication now. Uh, but challenge is to do it across all cancers, like an orthopedic surgery, you know, an or, or, or a sarcoma that is going in. Or, uh, a, a, you know, a, a tumor where, you know, we are like a neuro or a, or a glioblastoma scheduled for an RT. We don't see them uh, in a pre-RT stage or a pre-surgical stage. Uh, so there are challenges, but um, there is a lot of evidence. So we need to get started somewhere and keep doing it. Yeah. I don't think we can, you know, just say that we we can't. I think we should take efforts, like how Rajeshwari said, we take efforts to, you know, establish protocols and keep doing what has to be done. 
and whatever whenever results come and we support we add on to the evidence and keep uh you know adding yes. on to it. we need to keep trying at the end of the yeah. day right. uh shukda you want to add yes. on on to it uh when we're just talking about the eras protocol uh recently we had our uh, icnc con- uh, conference. conference so one of the doctor was elaborating about the eras protocol then we i understand where we are where we stand because it is quite you uh, know impressive way it what the protocol says is uh, we gently note it down uh, the uh, through has before we have to feed the patient before the surgery one hour before surgery we need to feed the patient with a uh, thing but actual protocol it's totally different from the practice what we are doing it up so i think there is one uh, you know eras uh, uh, you know society itself it's been functioning Function. where they are teaching and then how to go ahead with the protocol how to take forward the protocol the eras protocol in a hospital setup itself is they are doing it up so probably we can go ahead with the step by step because a person who is wanted to implement an eras protocol in the hospital probably they can do such they can go br- browse for it the society they i think they are they are training the dietitians as well as the doctors and then pretty nurses also they were tra- treating them so probably i think we can go ahead we can pitch in and just see about it actually yeah and mm-hmm. because the protocol has not just nutrition as one of the components yeah. they yeah. need to be a multidisciplinary First, approach i mean everything we, everybody needs to be on board not just the dietitians yeah. for the protocol yeah. to be successful that's right true true so robert do you have any experience with the ras protocol there in kenya yeah, yeah. thank you so much operate Yeah, yeah i i think uh, at some point um the practical uh, the practical application of the protocol at times has challenges for example the st- how to start parenteral feeding especially partial or total parenteral the aspen guideline says we have uh, when the patient has intractile vomiting other say uh, when we have um, high vistula the patient who is in coma the patient who is cannot retain maybe diarrhea continuous who cannot um who cannot be stopped with analgesics but at some point you find that a patient comes in walking but with very low bmi but very strong i don't know about your settings but the kenyan settings or rather the african settings you may find a patient with bmi of 15 just walking in and now this patient has to start chemotherapy or rather uh, radiotherapy then uh, and the patient is not taking enough or there was delay in diagnosis of cancer which uh, at kenyan settings we we lack the diagnostic uh, equipments so find that the patient comes with cancer stage 4 the, the oncology say let's start um um uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy then suddenly the patient experiences the side effects the diarrhea the vomiting um and the loose motion at the same time the owners of this patient which is the oncology says now that we cannot start parenteral feeding because there is associated with infection at some point you find that it's okay you can start this patient with parenteral uh, nutrition or as opposed to rehydration and also giving dextrose most of them give dextrose 10% or dextrose 20% with ring as left lactate and no more saline which is purely there is no no caloric value in terms of proteins carbohydrates and fats and therefore i think we need to in collaborate in collaborate as a multidisciplinary team where we uh, we invite the oncologist or the doctor so that they can be the messengers of the information that nutrition is key the patient requires energy for other metabolic activities to take place in the body at the same time the patient requires energy to sustain the effects of medication and also a patient who is emaciated cannot tolerate the high doses of chemotherapy or radiotherapy they can be wheeled yes but now sustaining it is a question that we need to and and therefore in my practice i always uh, do a session with the oncologist and tell them the importance of parenteral nutrition or enteral nutrition at that time before they start even a chemotherapy or radiotherapy and therefore the outcome of early initiation of this enteral and parenteral uh, feeding is the, the, the outcome is very very okay but there is some case scenario where i find that the patient 
come in, start um, uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy, they go, you find that the albumin levels starts going down, down. And that is a great indicator of mortality. When the patient start exhausting the albumin, the store of energy, that means now that the patient cannot, the metabolic activities that takes place in the body will not be sustained. So often Thank these you. patients will come to you with, um, you know, side effects of chemo or adverse effects of chemo and radiation therapy, nausea, vomiting, or it could be a diarrhea. And this would limit their dietary intake as well. So what are some of the dietary adjuncts that you use um, to help ameliorate the effects, adverse effects of the medical management? Okay, for, for a patient who has diarrhea, we need to establish whether it's aseptic or not aseptic. Because uh, when the patient has diarrhea and it's aseptic, it means now that there is bacteria within the GIT. And therefore, when you stop it, you, 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 you are making the situation worse. So we need to assess first. Then what could be the cause of this um, vomiting? Some patients, when we assess the, the vomitus, we find that this patient cannot tolerate because of nausea, which will lead fire, uh, to vomiting. And therefore, we, we always incorporate uh, use medication like contracentron or platin so that they can stop. But some patients don't... Um, cannot withstand that. Even if you give high doses of placin, still there is vomiting. And therefore we need to uh, always establish and give some supplements which the patient can, can tolerate. These are supplements that are thick in consistency, which are not thin. So that um, they, and it's also an energy dense. And therefore giving this formula you give volume, a small volume with then energy dense. Then we supplement with parenteral feeds. Thank you. Thank you so much for those inputs. I think on that note, uh, Ms. Purpi, one last question I would like to ask you. Uh, have, what about use of probiotics and prebiotics? Does it help? And there was this one question in chat as well. Uh, would you really use probiotics in patient, patients who have severe mucositis? Does it help? Uh, or does it worsen the situation? Okay. Um, see, in our practical scenario, prebiotics, if you go to see, we Indian-based diets, so basically our, uh, uh, I may say, it go our diet plans have prebiotics mentioned in our uh, entire chart, which is there, because being Indians, we have good amount of, you know, the cereals as well as the uh, vegetables which are there. So the fiber content is there. And yes, uh, you know, uh, pre, uh, the prebiotics does help to a certain extent. Uh, so there are lots of, uh, we have put in a lot of uh, dietary guidelines behind our charts, which help us that, you know, the garlic, as we say, uh, if you can see the, uh, the garlic, the onion, which is there. So we've asked, uh, there's a liner which says that, you know, even if there is ginger garlic added to your diet, you need to add in, you know, a raw, fresh uh, garlic paste just immediately after you switch off the gas. So that's how we incorporate because uh, which is there. You know, then in the Indian scenario, um, even uh, the chickpeas helps a lot, which again, if you go to see overall in India, it, it becomes a staple diet also there. So it also helps us as well um, as uh, the, there are lots uh, which are there uh, in the probiotics also. Okay, because there's lots of, uh, that is, we use uh, curds and buttermilk, which comes as a staple diet, right? And uh, even we have also asked for flake seeds. You know, flake seeds also help us because it helps in reducing the inflammation, uh, uh, which is there into the diets. Mm -hmm. So uh, flake seeds, also we ask them to dry roast and you can, you can add, it as, add it as a sprinkler. Mm -hmm. So your oral feeds, your oral diet, I must say all our patients go do have the prebiotics and probiotics incorporated in smaller amounts into their feeds as well as for the enteral feeding uh, you do nowadays also you have supplementations uh, the nutraceuticals which have come in with uh, the resistant uh, maltodextrins um, dextrose which is there as the inulin is also incorporated so that also helps so it does help um, at this case specificity which is there uh, Ms. Rajeshwari, Dr. Esther, would you like to add uh, in terms of use of probiotics and prebiotics? 
Uh, yeah, actually, prebiotic and probiotic combination is, uh, as Parabhi said, uh, yes, it is helpful. And particularly for a patient, which we have noticed in our practical experience with the, um, you know, patient coming with the chemotherapy and they have a severe toxicity with the end up ending up with uh, diarrhea or something like that. Probably this prebiotic and probiotic combination help us out. And a very simple, the diet, what we recommend for a diarrhea patient is the bread diet, the, you know, banana, apple, rice. Uh, banana, rice, apple, and toast. So this is the common uh, thing we recommend. Along with that, we recommend our prebiotic and probiotic as uh, Purabi was telling about almost 90%, uh, 95% generally the Indian population, we depend upon the curd. Uh, either it can be the southern, uh, southern region or the northern region. Generally, we prepare uh, one serving of curd, at least we'll be having it up. Either it can be for your dinner or it can be your lassi form, we have it. Or a simple probiotic drinks, nowadays it's been available in the market. So we recommend them to have at least one serving along with either of the meal, they can have it up. So I think that helps the, uh, you know, the, that soothes their uh, stomach and uh, that he helps to overcome the toxicity level also for that. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Now, nutrition obviously has a very big role in management of cancer, but it also has a very big role to play in prevention of cancer as well. So as we summarize today's panel, can I have like a quick take home message from each of the panelists on what are the foods to include in the diet in order to prevent cancer? Are there certain antioxidants that we can use? We can start with Mr. Robert. But on the question. Yeah. Well, what are some of the foods that we can include in the diet to prevent cancers? Um, thank you so much. Uh, given that uh, uh, the current research uh, states that uh, there is no known cause of cancer, many publications that have just gone through um, say that uh, food can be the source of cancer, food can be the promoters of cancer, food can be the initiators of cancer. And therefore, uh, in, our, in our settings, that is Kenya, we have seen that uh, there is so many uh, companies, food companies, that are bringing in food, which are fast, they are ready to eat foods. And uh, these foods, we lack regulation in terms of what are the components of specific anti-nutrients or chemicals that are used to preserve these foods. And therefore, I think starting from um, maybe production, we need to know what are the fertilizers, what are the composition, what are the effects of these fertilizers, what are the effects of the chemicals that are being used to control weeds. Then number three, preparation methods. Uh, in, our, in urban settings, you find that uh, foods are boiled with polythene packs what are the end um, effects on the food that we are consuming it? Because if we are heating these foods up to a temperatures of 140, 150 degrees, it means the chemicals that are being used to manufacture these um, polythene bags will enter into the water, which will be absorbed by the same same maize. So wherever you take now, it can be the cause of cancer. I'm just thinking about it, it can be the cause of cancer. Answer. Then number two, yeah, number two, I, as I finish, number two is um, the preparation method of food. You find that uh, for food to be like uh, the mixture of beans and maize to cook faster, there are some um, chemicals that are used so that these foods can, can, be, can cook fast and be ready. I think also we need to check on that. And if there is a study that needs to be done, is actually based on food preparation and food production. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Robert. Uh, can I have a summary from Ms. Rajeshwari? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, in order to prevent cancer, I think uh, we need to have, we have to focus on a good food. I mean, uh, in, uh, by, in, the, in the way of uh, having a good amount of vegetables and fruits, we need to take it out as uh, and a good amount of uh, protein, whatever sources it, it can be from vegetarian or the non-vegetarian sources. At the same time, we need to keep yourself hydrated. So that is much more needed, rather, uh, just similar like whatever we are having, the food consumption we are having, 
we need to focus on our hydration part how much ever water we need to take it out minimum 2 to 3 liters of water for a normal adult even some people used to have more than that it is depending upon their activities they can have to it and more about the lifestyle modification you, you know cutting down on alcohol and the smoking those stuff also we can cut it down and some amount of physical activity is a must for every individual it can be a simple walking we can do it at least half an hour to 45 minutes in a day almost for four to five days in a week we can do it and uh, moreover uh, we need to have a good amount of sleep so that is also essential for any individual to prevent a cancer 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 and patient who have already been having a cancer and getting treated in order to prevent the recurrence and <coughs> these steps can be followed for those individuals also they can have it up having a good amount of having a good uh, nutritious food they can focus on to have a good amount of vegetables and fruits in their diet in spite of going go focusing on juice they can have fruits in spite of having as a whole fruit they can focus on the same thing they can try to have it up so this will prevent them to have in order to prevent as well as to avoid cancer in for a normal individual also Thank you, Ms. Rajeshwari. Uh, Dr. Esther. Uh, just to add on to the extensive list, I think evidence has said in terms of uh, recurrence or, you know, uh, in terms of nutrition, it is more of lifestyle changes. Um, obesity is linked to onset of a lot of breast and gynac <laughs> cancers. So maintaining a healthy body weight with uh, ample amount of physical activity is not just important as a preventive aspect of cancer, but also that is probably one of the only evidenced, uh, uh, you know, to say to prevent a recurrence of especially gynecological cancers, uh, cancers of ovaries, uh, cervix, uh, head and neck, of course, as Rajeshwari said, it is to do more with uh, smoking and alcohol abstinence. So just those two points from my end. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, but we can add two words from you. Yeah, uh, just to echo Rajeshree ma'am as well as uh, uh, Rajeshree ma'am. The thing is, uh, as uh, India, you know, we have a variety of diet which is there. So based, the best is your Indian traditional diet, whatever religion it is, a well-balanced diet that we were we are following, okay, because it incorporates all the fresh fruits and vegetables through which the antioxidants will come in. Keep a rainbow diet so we get all the phytonutrients uh, which are there, okay, as well as we are very much rich in the functional foods our nation so you know it's better to incorporate the kitchen uh, functional foods like curcumin which is there okay which is the garlic which is there so that can be incorporated as well as uh, for the survivorship as ma'am really reiterated that is do we need to maintain the idol the maintain our body weights you know so uh, the physical exercise even the sleep is very very important for cancer patients to come in i would also add on to say this we need because of the western Nile culture which has come into our uh, nation we need to avoid the processed meats and the processed foods which are available as well as avoid uh, the simple carbs which are there the sugars the jaggeries as well as honey because it leads to inflammation thank you Thank you so much for that. Uh, for one, <clears throat> I'm so sorry for that. So, uh, thank you so much, all the panelists, for your valuable time. Uh, we end our session here today. For the participants, I have shared the feedback link in. <coughs> We've also shared a message with the link for uh, the YouTube link of the sessions that have have been held up till now. We'll be making it public for you to access around 8th of March. So you'll be able to see and revise these sessions before you attempt the test. Thank you, everyone, for your time. and Have a good night. Bye. Thank you.